Hi, everybody. Andrew Champagne alongside J.D. Fox for this week's edition of Champagne and J.D. Before we go any further, huge thanks to Rachel McLaughlin for stepping in last week while I was under a neon colored rock, as it were, in Las Vegas, Nevada. Really excited to get some semblance of normalcy back by going into the desert for the first week of the NCAA basketball tournament. We'll dive into that a little bit. We'll also have Gino Bacola on to talk about the Florida Derby Day card, specifically the late pick four that begins in race number 11. That's not a misstatement, folks. 14 races coming up this weekend at Gulfstream Park. JD, it starts really early out here on the West Coast. They have no respect for me wanting to sleep in on a Saturday. They have no respect for things other than post times now. They tend to respect those. Thank goodness. Aiden Butler, if you're somehow watching this, we salute you. We thank you. Now, JD, you also want to good ask- job. Good job hiring Ashley. Indeed. The home run on every possible level. So, JD, you wanted to ask me about Vegas, I guess. Uh, do, do you want to like wheel into that in some way, so, shape, or form? And so how was Vegas, Andrew? You know, I, first of all, I was really hoping you'd have a, a better lead in for that than what I set you up for, but we'll move past that. We'll try to move on. Um, it was weird. Uh, first of all, it was really good to be able to see my dad for the first time in nine months. We both got our COVID shots. Thank goodness. Uh, and it wound up being a nice time to be able to spend with him and to be able to, as I've mentioned, get something close to normal. Now we were at Flamingo for the majority of the, of the trip. We were in the Flamingo sports book. Shout out to Cliff Brown and his friends. If y'all are watching, Thank you for letting us sit in some of your seats that were not taken. We really appreciated that. Making friends is a very good way to you know, potentially get seats in a time where seating has been limited. The Flamingo took out more than half of its seats, obviously with COVID and everything else. And also they sold some of their seats, which you sort of had to figure was coming at some point. But from a betting standpoint, she. was a rough weekend for a lot of different reasons. Thankfully, my Monday was pretty good. I had Oregon on the money line. That worked out really well for me against Iowa. They let Luca Garza get his points. He had 36 points. The rest of Iowa, I think, barely had 36 points, and Oregon just started raining down threes. It was wonderful. Thoroughly enjoyed that. I also put some money on the over in Kansas, USC. I didn't see the start of the game because I was on my flight. I land and I see Kansas has three points through eight minutes of the game. Because that's what you want to see, right? When you've touched down, you have money on the over. The one thing you really want to see is a three seed in the tournament having three points through two media timeouts. The over covered by one lousy point. That's some small solace I can take. I came back with a little bit of action. Really like Florida State over Syracuse. Also played some game on the second day that, of course, right now is you know just totally out of my head. Whoop, there it goes. It'll come to me. Follow me on social media. I'll make sure to have all of that guidance squared away. And hopefully you can either follow my picks and make money or do everything the opposite of what I do and make even more money. Now, the real question at the end of the day. Sure. Is did you go on Fremont and play Sigma Derby? Um, I did go on Fremont Street. Got to say it was really cool. They had on the big board right up on top of amidst all the, the casinos, a big blank bracket for the NCAA tournament with all the teams in there. That was really cool. Did not get to play Sigma Derby. However, did manage to go to Circa, met up with uh, one of my friends that I've met via horse racing Twitter, Ryan Dickey, who works out there. Hi, Ryan. How you doing? Uh, wound up playing blackjack at both Binion's and Fremont. I think my dad wound up catching a really significant head cold from one of the dealers at Fremont. I somehow managed to avoid that. So, woohoo. But at any rate, Fremont Street, always a good time. The Strip, a good time. But the crowds were in weird places. Uh, obviously, with the sports book being at half capacity, not necessarily the kind of crowds you expect there. I made the mistake of getting a normal timed lunch on Saturday. Usually when I go to Vegas, I get lunch around 11. It beats a lot of the crowds. You can sometimes slip into either In-N-Out or the pizza joint next door near the high roller to be able to get a lunch really quickly, go back to your seat and watch the rest of the game. If you saw my Instagram story, again, Instagram at 128 winners, shoulder to shoulder, 
in that promenade area at around 12, 1230 on Saturday afternoon. It was jarring to see that many people in that small an area, given everything that's going on in the world. But on the whole, casinos did what they could to sort of mitigate the crowds and make everybody feel safe. So shout out to them for that. Um, I will say you missed out by not going to Jabberitos there on that same strip of, of turf because the best sushi burritos you're ever going to have. Uh, I don't have time for sushi burritos when I'm in Vegas. Give me a couple of slices of pizza. Give me a burger and I'm good. That's all I need. I'm not, I'm not high maintenance, though. I will say I did stop in at Maxi's, which is the new deli that's near the high roller. Tremendous pastrami sandwich. Outstanding. And somebody in the parking garage back there agrees with me because they just honked their horn. Thanks, buddy. So March Madness, obviously one of the big reasons why you're there. You touched on some of your plays. I'll talk about how horribly wrong I've been. Me too. Um, obviously, you, you mentioned Luca Garza. And I'm like, this is going to be a chaotic tournament. Best player. Let's just go. So I had Luca Garza and the Iowa Hawkeyes winning the whole sh- kit and caboodle. That didn't go well. No, no, it did not. Uh, Thankfully, my pick to win it all is still alive. I went with the, you know, the chalk. Yeah, it's me. I go with chalk. I pick Gonzaga. But uh, no, uh, Dana Altman had a tremendous game plan for Iowa. He was not going to let Luca Garza single handedly beat the team. There was one stretch in the first half where Garza had 21 or 22 points, the Iowa bench had 17 points. Doesn't that mean Fran McCaffrey's playing the wrong guys? Just saying. Actually. And obviously, uh, Dane Altman's longtime top assistant, Darren DeVries, taking my Drake Bulldogs through the first four with a win over former NBC foe Wichita State. Wichita State then, cover, though. Thank you. And uh, they ran into a bit of a second-half buzzsaw from USC. They were in that game most of the way. Tank, Hemp, Tank, Tank Hemphill. Uh, did not play in the second half, and obviously was coming off of foot surgery. That was not a full-strength Drake team. We're going to see a crazy good Drake team, maybe a preseason top 25 Drake team uh, next year with uh, Mr. Iowa basketball. Tucker DeVries, familiar last name there, head coach's son, turned down uh, scholarship offers from Florida, Oregon, Creighton, stayed in Des Moines. The Proud kid of him. would have gone to Florida and stayed in Iowa. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Okay. <laughs> Mr. Basketball in the state of hey. Iowa. So still a lot of fun uh, with the NCAA tournament. Obviously I want to touch a little bit on some of the quality issues between the men's tournament and the women's tournament. They got around to it, but when originally asked about it and Mark Emmert having no idea what was happening in relation to it was not a good look for the NCAA. And obviously I've got some friends that work there and uh, I, I know it's, 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 it's tough to, to come back from, but I will say that they did the best they could to get things turned around as quickly as they can. And hopefully this is a lesson everybody uh, uses moving forward. Any How other thoughts on March know? Madness? How yeah. can you not know? That's the thing that gets me. I worked in an athletic department for a couple of years. It's no secret of that. That's where I got my start. That's actually how we met. Um, Look, it's no secret that one March Madness tournament is treated differently from another. You go to Vegas, you bet one March Madness tournament. You don't bet the other one. Now, there are a number of different reasons for what happened with the women's facilities and with women's COVID testing, which seriously, we're in a pandemic. How are you not springing for what's universally renowned as the most effective rapid testing way to test for if somebody has something that has caused a worldwide pandemic? There's just no excuse for some of this stuff. Now, the one word of caution that I will throw out there, and a couple of people that I know in the sports industry have said this, someone posted... It may have been from the NCAA uh, women's basketball account. It may have been from something else. I don't know. But they were directing their rage at the person that was running the Twitter account. Don't do that. The people running the Twitter account are doing their level best to promote the sports that they are tasked with promoting. They're not the reasons that the women didn't have a proper weight room or that they didn't have proper COVID testing. It's not on them. I know it's tempting to shoot the messenger. Don't do that. I'd like to think as a society we're better than that, though. Maybe I shouldn't. 
And if you need help with your social media, I, I can't figure out how to point. I'm pointing this way. I, I, I don't. My pull Hi, which way am I pointing? How you doing? How you doing? This Apple guy is, uh, is available for all of your social media strategy and uh, hire him, please. Thank you. I really appreciate that. That's very kind. Uh, quick update before we move into our segment with Gino Bacola. And there we go. You're going to probably sprain your wrist doing that. I don't want you doing that. We don't exactly have healthcare plans here on Champagne and JD. But quick update here. Have had a couple of really good interviews. A couple of people have reached out with some really cool stuff. If you've reached out in some way, shape or form, I thank you. If you said other things that I've taken people to task for on Twitter, just go away. Uh, anyway, though, thank you very much for the support that's been out there. Really thankful to have that amongst my friends and my family. I uh, don't know where I'd be without it. So thank you very much. Now, JD, I'm going to do a little magic trick for you here. I'm going to clap my hands. And when I get done clapping my hands, we're going to have Gino Bacola joining us to preview the late pick four I, I on Friday. I believe it was Gino's birthday this week as well. So it maybe was. you made the his birthday happen with the same clapping. We'll see. I don't know. Then again, if I clap all the time and people around me start getting older and aging, that's going to be a problem. But you know what? We're going to tempt fate. We're going to try this. You ready? You sitting down? Okay. Yep. And we're back with analysis of Florida Derby Day at Gulfstream Park, a 14 race program with a late pick four starting in race number 11. That's not a misstatement. 14 races and a late pick four starting in race number 11. It's a marathon, not a sprint. So we needed some help. We called into the bullpen and we got Gino Bacola to come on to talk late pick four with us at Gulfstream Park. Gino, how you doing, buddy? Doing great. Bringing the righty. Here he is to help out. Uh, we've got Kentucky Derby points on the line. We've got Kentucky Oaks points on the line. Also, this is basically the last round of the preps, you know, with, with the Florida Derby on Saturday and with the, uh, the Jeff Ruby over at, at uh, Turfway, the first round. And and so we're not going to get a lot of opportunities to see a lot of these horses like last run before the Kentucky Derby. Yeah. Now, before we go any further, Gino, when you come on, good stuff usually happens for me. The first time you came on, pixelated Andrew came on and capitalized <laughs> on an all button at Oakland Park. The second time you came on, Monday morning QB won at Laurel in one of the Maryland Million races. Yeah, that was very yeah. good for me. Uh, can you spread a little of that goodwill over to JD as, you know, residual karma from him and Rachel doing such a good job filling in for me last week while I was gone? He had your Joan Rivers filling in, I believe, is uh, what he said for the uh, the J Champagne and JD so show. And as long as it's one of us winning, I'm happy with that. I'm selfless go. enough to where if it's one of my buddies here, I'm okay with that. So let's just hope somebody can lead uh, the folks out there watching and listening to a couple winners. And for legal purposes, let's hope it's not me because obviously in the state of Arizona, I cannot wager on the upcoming Florida Derby Day at Gulfstream <laughs> <Street> Park. Details, <laughs> details, JD, details. <laughs> now on that incredibly sobering note, we're going to roll right into race number 11. It's the start <laughs> of the late pick four. It is the Cutler Bay Stakes for three-year-olds going one mile on the turf course. We've got a field of nine. Pete Iel was the morning line man. He does a great job. He's got Annex as the five to two morning line favorite. I think Annex is going to be bet down a little bit off of that. I think he's going to go off probably about seven to five, eight to five. JD, who's going first? How do you want to do this? Uh, go ahead, Andrew. We're I'm not going to spoil anything in saying we're all going pretty deep here. So you yeah, might as well start. Yeah. Now, I can't speak for JD and Gino, nor I think would they want me to speak for them, given my <laughs> track record of that. True. Having said that, I approach this pick four ticket with a mindset of, at least one short-priced favorite has to lose in order for this pick four sequence to pay reasonably well. And I'm going against Annex, not because I don't think Annex can win. He's absolutely talented enough to win, but that Palm Beach was really weird. They had a runoff going 22-1, and 44-4. and four. I just don't see that kind of scenario happening here. And as talented as Annex is, I'm going to try to beat him in an attempt to extract some value out of this sequence. I'm going four deep in here. To me, one of the more impressive last out efforts in this field came from the horse that draws the rail. That's number one hyper focus. Gulfstream Park's turf course has played very, very fast for most of its meet. When you go a half mile in 49 and two, you're supposed to win. Hyper focus 
broke dead last in a field of seven, passed them all, won impressively. This was a two-year-old last year that Todd Pletcher had high enough hopes for to send in the Bashford Manor at Churchill Downs. So this was a precocious horse that showed some talent right off the rip, maybe going along on turf is what he wants to do. He's my top pick in this race. I'm using number five, King of Dreams, who I think is the most likely early speed. I'll also use number eight, Step Dancer, for a lot of the same reasons I like Hyper Focus. He's a closer that's shown he can overcome an unfavorable pace situation. And I'm going to give Fighting Force one more shot. I Christian. Love yes, exactly. <laughs> Hi, Christian Cage. How you doing? I loved him too back in the Texas Turf Mile. Really weird trip that day. He was on the lead. He doesn't want to be on the lead. Then he goes in the Palm Beach where he's third early, but 20 lengths back. He makes his first start for a new barn. I'm very curious to hear the story behind how that happened. But eight to one on the morning line, I think we'll get it. And if I get off of him in this spot and he wins, it's not going to be pretty for either myself or those around me. I need to throw him in, give him one more shot. We're trying to beat Annex here. Hopefully I've gone deep enough in order to do that. And we're already off to a weird start, Andrew, because I have the same top selection as you do in this race, which is the what? one hyper focus. Who are you? I, I, oh, look I at know. You. But the one thing I will say, the horse I want to shout out here, if you like hyper focus, I, I think you have to give what makes Sammy run a look here. Obviously, uh, you, you, I, I think you can throw out the last effort back at Tampa Bay Downs was never really in that race, but two back Goldstream Park loses to hyper focus actually gets the uh, gets the lead top of the stretch just gives way but a strong effort only losing by a half length and I think obviously was the favorite in that event. So I think what makes Sammy run at 12 to one could be the speed of the speed here in what won't be a very fast pace. I also am playing against annex. Um, I, I just, I think that horse is going to need a lot to run into and has gotten a lot to run into the last two times. Maybe the horse is talented enough to make up for that, but we don't know at this point. And uh, Andrew is looking puzzled here. You're not supposed to agree with me. These podcasts <laughs> think when we agree. We're supposed to provide incredibly different opinions. Do you not get the memos? <laughs> that will come in due time. Okay. But I think Gino will also spread the love yep. about spreading in this race here. Yeah. Spreading. Uh, I have hyper focus pick second. I think hyper focus is a must use uh, in all exotics. So from all three of us, I think. Um, and so maybe just off of that, maybe hyper focus takes a little bit of money and annex isn't quite as over bet. We'll see. Um, I, I I'm spreading out and I'll, I'll be able to, to play this pick four ticket in a um, sort of using logical and then, a bomb in the rest of the legs moving forward. I'm just kind of hoping to get through this first leg here and uh, we'll use hyper focus. Who I think is very logical. The horse I want to talk a little bit about is the, um, the number seven. It can be done who I think is a bit interesting in here. Stretching back out has a little bit of pace. I think is going to be either on the lead or pretty close to it. If you look back at his last couple efforts. So on October the 31st, Javi was aboard that day. It just wasn't that great of a ride. Uh, it was kind of just wide on the grass all the way. That's not the type of winning trip you get on the turf when you're giving up, you know, uh, you're three wide and you're just giving up ground all the way around. And then came back going five furlongs and was in a little bit tight, was squeezed back at the start, was back to last and really came running late. I think that race will set him up pretty well for this spot. I think he probably gets bet down a little bit off of a 20 to one morning line. He feels more like a 10 to one shot or so in here. So I'll use him. I'll use the one hyper focus i'll use annex i'll also include two horses who kind of have a, a very similar profile step dancer and lucky law um they're uh they're horses who have shown some good turf success uh lucky law was a one was a horse who had good turf success took a shot in the sam f davis i think that's an easy race to just excuse and then we'll also uh throw in step dancer who has really done not a whole lot wrong on the grass maybe needs a, a race but um this horse is not all that far off from uh from being undefeated in a pretty decent effort behind fire at will so Give me a, a spread out race. One, four, six, seven, eight. So I think what's clear. interesting there, Barkley tag doesn't necessarily always have them revved up off the layoff yet. All three of us use the horse, but mm -hmm. didn't really feel the need to like expand upon that horse. So that's yeah. an interesting thing to notice. I, I think he's, he's pretty just, he's pretty logical. Like he just hasn't done wrong. You know, I don't think it's, it's even like having to sell people on why I think the, the main reason, like you said, is just, 
do we think this horse is going to be 100% ready to fire his absolute best shot? I think if he just kind of comes back with the races that he ran last year and you get a little bit of that three-year-old improvement, he's he should be right there. And on the plus side, by the way, the three of us combined to go eight deep in a nine-horse field. You know what that means? If you like Fulmini, go to the windows now. immediately. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we all agree that there is room to spread in the first leg of the late pick four, race number 11. We'll move on now to race number 12. This is the Gulfstream Park Oaks, a grade two event for three-year-old fillies going a mile and a 16th. Field of seven in here and the favorite number three, Crazy Beautiful, making the second start off the layoff for trainer Ken McPeak. She was last seen running second in the grade two Devona Dale, one of the most bonkers races to this point in the Gulfstream Park meeting. I'm still trying to figure out what to make of that race. The winner of that race was 50 to one, maybe even higher than that. Uh, as far as how we break that race down is concerned, I'm still trying to figure it out. JD, you want me to go first and stay consistent with the order throughout? Okay. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, I need to use Crazy Beautiful simply because stretching out to two turns is something she's shown she can do. She was second in the grade one Alcibiades at Keeneland. Then it's safe to assume something went wrong in the Breeders' Cup Jewel and Affiliates. We didn't see her again for a little while after that. I think she makes a lot of sense. She's got some tactical speed, more than she's shown in her last couple of starts. I think she might well be closer to the pace early on in here. I'm also going to use horse number six in the program, and I'm not even going to try to put Mil you. Okay. Whatever Gino said, go with that. Um, going back to two turns, I think, is going to help this horse, and I'm willing to just draw a line through the Devona Dale in this case. Maybe she needed the race. Maybe she just didn't take to the surface that day. She's been working very well at Payson Park for Bill Mott, who has been firing on all cylinders this meet at Gulfstream. So I'm going 3-6, two of the logical horses in here, maybe the two betting favorites. J.D., how'd you see it? And I'm going too deep as well, but I'm including Cone Lima. I think Cone Lima will get a nice trip coming from the rail. I think Cone Lima makes sense as the only speed. You look back, obviously he's won uh, three of the last four on turf, getting up on the DQ of Spanish Love Affair uh, last time, which horrible. I know Andrew... Just a horrible disqualification yeah. that was indefensible as it was happening. It wasn't good. Yeah, so that was in the Had Here Comes started. the Bride. <laughs> yeah, I, I expected it, but you look back, got the got the maiden win over this track, does appear to have a pace edge on the rest of the field. So I, I think Cone Lima is a must use. And again, crazy beautiful. Uh, the only person in the world I know that liked whole Bodemeister is Dan Torgman on that day, <laughs> and he yep. gave the horse out and made a little bit of money. So uh, shout out to my, my guy, Dan, but yeah. I still don't see what he saw in that horse. All I can tell is that horse has been reluctant to load twice in the career and has two wins in both of those races. I, I don't know what that even begins to mean, but with that said, um, I'm just going those two uh, middle fool, the, the last race. I don't know what to make of it. I, I see, you know, the bullet work at Payson. I, I don't know what to make of it. The, the race last time out was just so bad that I have to trim down the ticket and mill fool. If Milfool beats me, she beats me. I don't know what accent that was. Gina I was trying to ask. Show. Yeah, it that was, was not good. Yeah, that it was, was like good. a combination of a few different ones. Um, I'll, and I'll be doing uh, that. I'll be combining a, a little bit from each one of you. Um, I'm going to use the one Cone Lima. I actually think she she might be like the best horse in this race. Um, she's actually run well on the dirt before previously. I think she probably gets the lead from the inside and. I don't really know how good Crazy Beautiful is. She might just be better than most of this field and be able to, to beat them. But I'll, I think Milfu has the highest ceiling. I, I was really impressed with some of her races last year as a two-year-old. And I think no matter what would have happened in the Devona Dale, I would have been willing to excuse it and expect some improvement from her second start forward. It's just when it's so bad, it's hard to, you know, and you look back at it and you wonder why. You know, I, I she just... Didn't really get in. She did kind of have a little bit of trouble and backed up and then just didn't come on again. So uh, I'm willing to give her another shot here. So I'll use the one in the six as two logical contenders, but uh, maybe, maybe like your second and third choices if Crazy Beautiful gets a little money. I actually wouldn't be shocked if any of the three of them ended up being favored, though. It really wouldn't surprise me. 
It's going to be a good betting race, that's for sure. I don't think you're going to see a nine to five, eight to five favorite. I think no. you're going to see three, maybe four horses between five to two and seven to two. And that's at least a square price, especially if, say, the horse we don't have on the pick four tickets winds up winning the first leg and we need to start playing pick threes of shame. So, race number 13 is the grade three Orchid. This is a fun race to handicap. Older turf distaffers going the marathon distance of a mile and three eighths. Always shopping, horse number nine in the program, a runner that has found new life going these sorts of distances. She is the eight to five favorite, and it's easy to see why. She's won three of her last four starts. The lone defeat came by a head in the grade three Dowager last year at Keeneland. She's two for two at Gulfstream with a very impressive win in the La Prevoyante. She's my top pick. She just makes a lot of sense here. I'm pretty happy that they were able to bring her back. It looked like maybe they were considering a potential stop in the broodmare shed for her because she's now a multiple graded stakes winner after that win in January. Happy we're going to see her, and I think she's going to do a lot of really cool things this year as a classy five-year-old mare that is on the verge of possibly the prime of her career. I'm going too deep in this race. I'm using Always Shopping. I think Always Shopping is definitely the horse to beat, and I'm hoping down here we can wind up putting that up. Maybe. There we go. Thank nice. you, Jake. Appreciate nice. it. Right on cue. Uh, however, there's one other horse that I need to consider, and JD's already smirking because the last time we had her on the show and she ran, I called her Mighty Molly at least one. Shout <laughs> out to Molly Holly, new WWE. Paul Faber. Wrestling reference, everybody drink. Now, number four in the program is Morning Molly, and I needed to use her because what has she done wrong on turf? Not a whole heck of a lot. The question mark here is, does she want to go a mile and three-eighths? I think she can. Her race last time out in the grade two Hillsboro at Tampa was very good. She just missed that day. She's run first or second in every one of her turf starts, and from a buyer speed figure standpoint, she doesn't have to improve all that much in order to win this race. She's eight to one on the morning line. Tom Proctor knows how to train horses to win these types of races. Needed to have her on the ticket, even though always shopping is my top pick. Four nine for me in race number 13. And no, we're not even done yet. JD, your thoughts. <laughs> I see this differently than the public or differently than uh, Pete did when he made the morning line. My, my top selection in this race is actually the six crystal. And you look back at that allowance event on January 14th at Gulfstream Park going the very strange distance of a mile and seven sixteenths. Really the first time that this horse has gotten a chance to extend out past a mile and a sixteenth and was just much the best. You could tell Bravo had uh, her in hand the entire length of the stretch, just waited, made the one move, asked the horse once, and the horse beat the uh, enjoy it while he can for fun. But enjoy it while we can. I also include on this ticket because I do feel that that horse can get this distance. I'm going deep here, two, four, six, seven, nine. And I even would give Bellora a shot here and feel bad that I left Bellora off the ticket here because that could be the early speed that could get brave on the front end and take these uh, these ladies wire to wire. So I'm going five deep and wishing I had kind of gone six deep, Gino. Uh, I think always shopping is uh, necessary. Um, she's just gotten so good. And what makes her difficult to try to beat is her tactical speed. You know, it's like when, you, when you're playing against a horse who's a stone-cold closer, sometimes you can find races where you think they might be vulnerable. She just makes her own trip in almost every single race. So I, I I will include her. The horse who I'm, I'm very interested in is the one warlike goddess who won her first two starts very impressively. And then in her most recent start on February the 27th, she came off a layoff. She had not raced since uh, the end of October. So it was a race she probably needed uh, for her best effort. And I thought she ran sneaky. Well, she actually earned a pretty nice figure, even in running fit that day. She hopped at the start. She was dead last. She was like 10 lengths off. She had to angle out widest of all. She did make up some late ground she finished fifth that day and in that race the horses who were one two three and the finish they were one three two all the way around the racetrack it was just no passing uh in that type in that particular race so if this race does have a little more pace up front i think she should save all the ground i have no concern with her getting the trip because she's already won at this distance before i think she's pretty lightly raced with some upside in here and if she is in that like six to one or over range she's a horse i'll make maybe a, a little bit of a win wager on and try to hook her up in some other exotics with uh always shopping and then um some other horses that you guys mentioned underneath 
I'm happy you mentioned Warlike Goddess because that was the last horse I threw out. I liked her a little bit last time out in the, the very one. She ran pretty well that day, second off a layoff for that guy, Bill Mott. At a minimum, I'll be playing some saver doubles with that one because I don't think she comes down too much off that 10 to 1 price if she comes down at all. So yeah. if you're looking for a price, you could certainly do worse. I was trying to keep the cost of my ticket down a little bit. That's the reason I did not throw her in. Now, we move on to the main event of the program. It's actually the main event of the Gulfstream Park Championship meet. This is the grade one Florida Derby. Three-year-olds going a mile and an eighth. The headliner of this 11-horse field, and yes, 11 horses. There's going to be another page of graphics with one horse on it. Sorry, that's <laughs> the way we do things here. Greatest honor, the six to five morning line favorite. Spielberg, the second choice, coming in for trainer Bob Baffert. A couple of big names that you see on the screen right there. You see Pletcher. You see Mark Cassie. There's number 11, Papetu, who was a horse that I know some people really liked last yeah. time out in the Fountain of Youth. Ran a decent third that day at a pretty big price. Now, as far as this race goes, I see it unfolding in one of two ways. If there's any sort of pace battle up front, I think Greatest Honor wins for fun. I think Greatest Honor is simply the most talented horse in the field. I think he's going to get better as the distances get longer. I think my ticket's going to show up at some point. There we go. Good setup there, JD. Thank you. Uh, greatest Honor to me hits me as the most likely winner in here. He was not supposed to win the, fa the Fountain of Youth last time out. This was a race that even though it said it favored closers in the daily racing form, I got to take exception to that. Drain the Clock is a seven furlong horse with legit seven furlong speed. You go 47 to the half, 111 and 2 to the 6 furlongs. Drain the clock supposed to win that race. Greatest honor came and got him. I don't think that was necessarily a track favoring closers as much as it was greatest honor being the best horse. Now, the big difference between a mile and a 16th at Gulfstream and a mile and an eighth, the configuration is totally different. Longer stretch, I think that plays in a greatest honor's hands. However, I needed to use the flashy horse. That's number nine, Collaborate, who last time out, well, all he did was break his maiden with a 90 buyer speed figure and win by more than 12 lengths. Yeah, kind of tough to ignore something like that. Collaborate does break from the nine hole in an 11 horse field. That's not ideal with a fairly short run into the first turn. But if Collaborate clears and gets comfortable, I think he could be sitting on a pretty big race. I think this is a pretty simple set of rider instructions for Tyler Gaffleone. Go early, see if you can clear, and if you can clear, get comfortable. I think one of those situations comes out. Either they duel early, someone tries to go with Collaborate that doesn't necessarily have a shot, and that sets things up for greatest honor, or Collaborate gets the drain-the-clock trip, and Collaborate turns out to be better than drain the clock going a mile and an eighth. 7-9 for me in race number 14, the Florida Derby, rounds out a $16 ticket for me. Four by two by two by two. I'm trying to beat Annex in the first leg. We do that. Maybe we get a second choice home in the second leg. Then we get the eight to one shot, Morning Molly home. Then we're live to a nice score. So $16 ticket for me. And even if it chalks out the last three legs, if Annex loses, it's still at least going to pay something. So that was the way I wanted to structure my ticket. And uh, I, I wanted to build some suspense here, so I'm going to go ahead and let Gino actually go. Okay, Ooh, build okay. Some suspense I like that. For I, Andrew, like that. I, know, I know Andrew is wondering who I'm going to single in the Florida Derby because year after year I single somebody in the Florida Derby and it's not the favorite. So. Uh, I will include greatest honor. Um, I, I'm, I'm having uh, two of the same horses that Andrew has. Uh, collaborate could be any kind. Greatest honor might get the trip. The horse who I think is a little bit sneaky uh, is Soup and Sandwich. I, I, you know, I don't know what he's beat. He beat Florida Breads in his career debut. He beat a field of three in career start number two. If you watch his races visually, though, he's got a ton of ability. And I don't uh, collaborate and greatest honor, I think, are the most talented in here. But nobody really scares me off all that much. Even a horse like Collaborate, who's got that sort of runoff speed. I think a horse like Soup and Sandwich can tuck in right behind nicely. I, I don't think he would be in this spot unless Cassie thought he really had a shot to at least hit the board in here. And he may be able to fall into a great spot. If he lets Collaborate go and he just kind of tries to track right behind and you know try to get the jump on some of the closers, um, I think that is the, the probable trip I would, uh, I would hope for him. Collaborate. Buzz horse, he could be any kind, and uh, obviously greatest honor with a win here. He will no doubt put himself into the conversation of uh, probably top three to four horses come Derby Day. He's probably in that right now, but another win. Um, just something to keep in mind, though. 
he's got the points. He doesn't need to win this race. Um, and so none of us have singled him. I, I don't know about JD. He said he kind of teased that he didn't, but um, just remember that moving forward and a good second or third for greatest honor in this spot would be very okay with their connections. That's all they would like to see moving forward. So if some of these other horses need to be a little bit more cranked to get the points, um, maybe this is sort of their A game right now, whereas Greatest Honor is more concerned with what's coming up in five weeks. All right, JD, here we go. I'm on the edge of my seat here. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm going to single collaborate here. And, and really, yeah. here's why. I don't think even with today's super breeding, I don't think in a while we've seen this big of horse as a three-year-old have this quick and fleet of foot. And even we saw that after the poor start in the debut on the slop horse made up a lot of ground late and then kind of got squeezed tight. I think if the horse had room to operate, we would have seen a really impressive gallop out from uh, collaborate on that debut, but Gaffleon was in tight, kind of had to pull the horse up a little bit, but I think that horse was much the best that day. And then obviously the, the day, the, uh, main breaking score is one of the more impressive performances we've seen this year from a, uh, a, a basically, you know, a second time starter in terms of that 90 buyer speed figure you mentioned, Andrew. And I think somebody's going to try to go with collaborate, but I actually look at the long stretch being an advantage for collaborate just based on the size and scope, the muscle structure. I think this horse from the breeding standpoint and how this horse looks physically can go the distance and can go even a Belmont distance. So I'm not worried about the mile and an eighth with the longer stretch. I think collaborate takes them wire to wire and closes out my $20 pick for play four by two by five by one. Andrew, um, I think this one, at least this year, is a little more logical than I've been in years past. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little disappointed. I got to say. You agreed was, in race one. You agreed in, or in, in leg one and in leg four. What's going on here? I, I'm, every once in a while, I think that there's been some sort of invasion of the body snatchers type situation going on in Arizona. Because every once in a while, we are in lockstep. And it's really strange because that never happens. But regardless, okay. take a look at our tickets here and see what you like. And I will add one more thing just so I can give an, a, a crazy opinion on this race. If you're playing tries and supers, take a strong look at Southern Passage to hit the board here for Dale Romans. That's my it, advice to you. Take a long, hard look at that horse. See, my, I was actually looking at him a little bit, and the one thing that actually scared me off of him is the one time he went two turns on dirt, no bueno. The one time he went two turns on turf, no bueno. I, I just think he's a miler. I think if anything, if they want to try him in a stakes race, Pat Day Mile maybe because he does have some sneaky form. You've got to dig a little bit to find it, but it's there. So yeah. no, anyway. I, I, I can I can see that. So we'll yeah. put we'll give Gino's ticket a little more love. Yeah. Thirty dollar play, five by two by two by three spread out. Um, and then what I've basically got, I've got opportunities for, uh, for some prices really throughout, um, in leg two of the sequence, I'll go against crazy beautiful. Uh, but we'll have an opportunity with the second and third choices and then very logical, always shopping, very logical, greatest honor and collaborate, but an opportunity for a bomb, uh, in, in both of those with the one, uh, in leg three and then with the eight in leg four. So, um, I have the opportunity to get maybe a couple $20 horses on this ticket. Um, but if it does chalk out and I can get a middle price or two, I could still catch this thing for a couple hundred bucks. Yeah. And that's ultimately, I think what we're trying to do something in that general sort of payoff range. In my particular instance, I'm trying to go against annex. We'll see if that works. And if it doesn't, well, at least I'll know right away. Right. Yep. So Pick anyway, before we let Gino go, we wanted to carve out a space in our show for, as Gino put it, obligatory wrestling talk. Now, JD, you have some semblance of where you'd like this to go, I think, but by all means, you you, you lead, I'll follow. For, for those of you that have been uh, hiding under a rock, obviously Gino has, that's what G said, a great podcast that you should listen to that covers all sports, all sorts of things from sports to, uh, you know, crazy shows that are on television that may be based on popular film franchises <laughs> uh, to wrestling. And one of the things with wrestling, obviously, is the classic wrestling segment, Andrew, or by DZ and Gino. Um, now with the move to Peacock and you not being able to just type in what you're looking for, how, how do you feel that, that uh, those segments uh, are going to go, Gino? I mean, it looks like Peacock is a disaster. It has been frustrating, and they're already... Um, 
editing uh, stuff off. And, and you know, the, the question is, is like, where do you draw the line here? Apparently, they've edited out uh, Roddy Piper from what WrestleMania six, I believe. Six, yeah. Uh, they've also yeah. edited. There's not the episode where Donald Trump takes over Monday Night Raw is yeah. not on there either. Um, so I guess they're just like picking and choosing things that they want to show and they don't want to show. We'll see. Um, hopefully, the WrestleManias will still at least be on because between now and SummerSlam, they're saying that it's going to take a while for the migration to get all of the, the, uh, the old library up there. So yeah, we might be stuck going through, uh, some bad WrestleManias. I know we, like we've been avoiding having to, uh, to do WrestleMania 11 and 12, because those are just like 11 is eh, 12. You kind of have to sit through the Iron Man match, which is great, but it's like, well, it's not really fun. Well, might get edited too, because there was the, you know, little head nod to, Oh, there was this guy in a Bronco that you may oh, have yeah, heard of. I didn't of. even think about that. Yeah. The back, it's, the back, uh, in the Hollywood brawl. Yeah. It's and they had the weird. The one thing I will say is I have a backlog of horrible, horrible wrestling shows that are not on the network, but are available publicly through other means. Great. I'm just saying so we might we'll need to dive in and do heroes of wrestling at some point soon. Oh, real goodness. We'll have to do that. We'll get I, we'll, Andrew. I, I want to see Darren Zocali's reaction when he hears heroes of wrestling come out of my mouth, because if you don't know that show, you at least know one promo from that show. That is the show where one Jake, the snake Roberts decided to do a dissertation on blackjack saying, you got 21, I got 22. He was, he was very, very intoxicated, and thank the good Lord he's still alive because it did not look good for him for a very long time. Thank you, Diamond Dallas Page. Bang. Andrew loves to uh, expand uh, the horizons of the uh, old wrestling rewatch. He's taken us to the AWA for the Team Ralph Challenge Swingers, series. We, we got a great interview with Ralph. That was funny. He's taken us back to WCW and NWA a few times. We had the uh, Bash at the Beach, the moment when Hogan uh, joined the NWO. He took us to NXT uh, for the first time the other day on a show that will play uh, next week on That's What G Said, where we covered TakeOver Brooklyn, uh, that match between Saw and uh, and Bailey, which was great. So yeah, Andrew uh, goes all over. Darren and I will stay in the wheelhouse sometimes, where we can get some Bret Hart on the show. <laughs> but Andrew will bounce all over. Yeah. And and the highlight of legend uh, of that pay per view, the Legends of Wrestling pay per view, I think is Tully Blanchard. And Tully Blanchard now, of course, part of the Pinnacle on AEW. See, he wrestled. Forward, he looked pretty good in the ring a few weeks back too. Yeah. Yeah. You don't lose it. You don't lose that sense of timing and the psychology. So no. that's for darn sure. So at any rate, we're very grateful to Gino for taking some time out of his busy schedule to stop by and take a look at the late pick four on Florida Derby Day. Gino, whatever you'd like to plug, my man, floor is yours. Go right ahead. Uh, that's what she said podcast. Um, I'm the host of it comes out uh, multiple times throughout the week, usually uh, late Tuesday and then late Thursday this week on, on the upcoming episode. We will uh, have similar uh, preview of the Florida Derby Day and the undercard races. We'll also preview um, the Turfway Park races with our buddy Darren Zocali, who you mentioned. We go through the pick four races eight through 11 and all stakes pick four on a really good card there. And then for the next uh, week and a half, I've had coverage of Sam Houston every single day throughout their meet. So you can find that there uh, Friday, Saturday, full card stuff. Uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier now. We're recapping that show with my buddy Tim Kelly from Disney Plus. Uh, that show from Disney Plus. So yeah, all, all over the place. I love Falcon and Winter Soldier, and I'm very happy that they gave the shield to Falcon because on his own, and this is going to really tick off some people, on his own, Bucky Barnes does nothing for me. I'm sorry. He just doesn't. And Falcon stole the show in Civil War. He had every good line in that movie. Dude shows up dressed like a cat, and you don't want to know more? <laughs> He's great. And he's the first episode is really good. It's like, it makes some um, superheroes and like a superhero story seem grounded, which is very cool that they're able to do that and like have them deal with these real life problems, family issues, money problems, stuff that everybody deals with. Awesome. Got to check that out. I haven't yet. I've been sort of preoccupied with other stuff coming back from being under a neon colored rock as it were, you know, <laughs> at any rate, Gino, thank you so much for stopping by. We really appreciate it. Best of luck on Saturday. 
happy to do it. And Andrew, you're on all the time, but JD, uh, and uh, before Derby or maybe leading up, I'll bring the two of you on and we'll, uh, we'll recap a few races uh, on that's what G said and get a little, uh, a little champagne and JD uh, vibe going too. Sounds good, my man. I'll talk to you later, buddy. Once again, thanks to Gina Bacola, friend of the show. We've had him on a couple of times. The That's What G Said podcast available wherever you get your podcasts from. Give it a listen. There's a lot of really good stuff. And I am not just saying that because I'm a regular contributor. If you like wrestling, you like horse racing, you like pop culture, you like more. Everything you can possibly want in a podcast is there. JD, you're raising your hand. Can I be honest and say the last part there with Gino? I had no earthly idea what you guys were talking about. What what part was that? The show on Disney Plus with oh, the, the Falcon and the, the Winter Soldier. So yeah, I I can't bring myself to spoil what happened in Endgame, even though the movie came out two years ago. I can't do it. So I don't playing. even I don't even know what you're talking about when you say Endgame. So that's the level of depth of not understanding what just happened. I just let you guys have fun with it. I'm not a movie JD. guy, Andrew. You know this, JD. I'm going to lock you in a room. I'm going to give you my Disney Plus credentials and you're going to watch Disney all Plus of the Marvels. Well, I'm going to make you watch them in order. There will be quizzes. There will be essay assignments and we're going to have a grand old time. It's going to be fun and you're going to get up to speed on something the rest of the world is already up to speed on. I had already offered this very early on when Gino started uh, talking about the Mandalorian, I want to say it's called. Yep. I asked him if he wanted to have a me watch it along from episode one, having never seen one second of any sort of Star Wars film. Um, I wanted to see how that would play, and, and I thought that would have been fun, and, and Gino thought it was a funny idea, but he thought fans actually wanted to like hear insight on the show and not just somebody very confused. What have you done with your life? I've done marvelous things. I have a child. Um I oh. have a job. Those, that's, I mean, too, that's soon. Like a, too soon. Too soon. Got a wife. <laughs> yeah. So, any, at any rate, though, uh, Gino Bacola's podcast, that's what G said, available wherever all you find podcasts are downloaded. It's good stuff. Take a listen. Maybe we can get JD to, you know, get into the 21st century and watch some Marvel stuff. At any rate, though, that's for another time. We're going to go into our final thoughts segment. And JD, I'm going to let you go first because you've got a couple of things to say about the Dubai World Cup. Yeah, it's going to be a great card at Maidan. It's going to be very... It, Andrew was talking about being upset at how early Gulfstream Park is going to go on Saturday morning. Uh, Maidan's a lot earlier than that, Andrew, as uh, first post is going to be 5.15 Pacific time. Actually, that's race two because race one, actually race one, sorry. The, I'm using time form US because that's what I had up. Race number one is an Arabian race, so it is not on time form US. So there is a race 42 minutes before that. So first post is like 4 a.m. Uh, Pacific time. Maybe I'll catch the last couple of races. I'm sorry. I need my well, beauty sleep. The, the last couple of races. I mean, that's that's going to be 9.50, I believe, okay. Okay. Pacific time. And I could be completely wrong with time zones here, and I apologize. That's going to be your uh, grade one Dubai World Cup, $12 million on the line. And I have a selection for you. Eight to one morning line. It's not Nick Hines. We're saluting the soldier in this case, the German bred um, Australian bloodline in the, in the breeding has done absolutely nothing wrong at Maidan. Uh, won the last two races, including uh, the grade one uh, all Maktoum challenge round three, and also the grade two round two uh, winning both of those preps for this race in pretty fine fashion uh, going to be uh Eight to one morning line, given the depth of the field, and we're also looking at American pools here. Um, I would expect the U.S. horses to take a bit of money, so I think you're going to get ten to one or above on Salute the Soldier, who has done absolutely nothing wrong this prep at Maidan, and I think has a big shot to win the Dubai World Cup. I have no opinion on any of the Dubai races, except that I'm very upset Tacitus got hurt because if Tacitus had not gotten hurt. I would have gotten to yell at all of the idiots on social media trying to convince themselves, today is the day for the 10th straight start with Tacitus. No, 
Sometimes horses just are what they are, people. Sometimes races are what they are. Sometimes horses are what they are. No, that robbed me of a good opportunity to do that. I'm just now getting over it. But the Dubai World Cup program, obviously world-class racing. If you're up early, you're into that sort of thing, it's going to be right up your street. So take a look at that if that's something that you're interested in. I'm going to spend my final thought congratulating another friend of the program. Chris Griffin has joined us a couple of times since we've launched this show. You may know him as the voice of the California Racing Fairs. You may know him now as the voice of racing at Sam Houston. He just took another job. He will succeed Keith Jones at Parks, what is, of course, formerly known as Philadelphia Park. He'll be the full-time announcer on a year-long circuit there. Really happy for him. One of the good guys, a guy that did a lot for me when he didn't necessarily have to. I'm pumped for him. Know he's going to be doing a lot of great work over there at Parks. And you're going to be able to take a listen to him year-round. So fantastic news for everybody involved there. Really happy for Chris. Really happy for his family. Yeah, no, it's it's a great opportunity and uh, for him to be in the same place as the rest of his family and have a full time gig and not meander the country. He's been putting in the work for a long time. So it's good to see him rewarded with a full time gig. Although, to be fair, I mean, fewer and fewer of those uh, in the horse racing scene when it comes to track announcers. But uh, but Chris is one of the good guys and uh, one of the best uh, out there. So much love to uh, our friend in the grandstand, Chris Griffin. And a guy that is a tremendous promoter and advocate for the game. We need those in as many powerful positions as we can. Kudos to Parks for making the right hire. Kudos to Chris for getting a job where I know he's going to be doing some excellent work. That'll wrap things up for this week's edition of Champagne and JD. We end on a high note. This is really cool. This doesn't happen a whole heck of a lot with us. I don't know what this show was this week. We're ending on a high note. We're agreeing on tickets. Like I I half expect, you know, Rod Serling to come back from the dead with the Twilight Zone music to close us out. But at any rate, kidding aside, special thanks to Gino Bacola for joining us to go through the late pick four at Gulfstream Park. 14 races on Saturday. So get tied on for that. Late pick four starts in race number 11. We had three tickets for you. You can take a look at that. Take a look at our analysis. If you like what we do, hit that subscribe button down below so you don't miss any of our weekly updates. For J.D. Fox, for special guest Gina Bacola, I'm Andrew Champagne. And since I wasn't here last week to do it, I'm going to take the opportunity to use the catchphrase, especially given all the stuff that's going on in Miami over spring break. Everybody, stay off the beaches, y'all. Especially in Arizona, where the state is all of a sudden wide open. Yeah, for sure. Stay safe, everybody. Take care.